Uh, my name is Andy Bird. I run product development, uh, product management, and product innovation for West Corporation. The weird thing is, is not many people know who West is, but West is a part of so much um, in your probably day-to-day -day lives. We have some of the largest enterprise customers, we'll, which we'll talk about today, as well as um, we do some pretty amazing innovative things. So let's kind of go through West. West as a whole, we're a 2.5-ish billion dollar company, and most people don't understand that when they make a 911 call, depending on where you are in the country, 60% of the time, that's gonna go through West. If you call your cable provider, your dish provider, you're likely making a call through the West network. We're based out of Omaha. Um, we also do the majority of conference calling that is done throughout the world. And w lots of people have asked me, I just moved to Omaha, and it was a weird move for me. And I kind of want to tell you about it because it all relates to this story. Why is West in Omaha? And if you look at Omaha on a map, it's not quite the center point, but it's pretty close to the center point of the country. So what's happened over the years is um, railroads back so Abraham Lincoln in, I don't know what year it was, he signed into law for Union Pacific to have railroads created, f get that set up. And they were going to do it in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And a guy named Thomas Durant, who became the CEO or the owner of Union Pacific, said, no, Omaha's closer to the next uh, city. So if you want to get from Florida to California, you have to have this like equal distance thing going on with uh, the railroad stuff. So railroads were set up in Omaha. Second, financial institutions. For whatever reason, Omaha became the center of all kinds of financial institutions. But then third, and besides the fact that Gary West lived there, uh, West Corporation got set up in Omaha. And here's why. You guys, everybody remember psychic hotlines? Anybody? Yeah? Yep. You remember those? We'll talk more about psychic hotlines here in a minute. But when you were making a call back in the day, you guys remember the whole rotary phone thing? And we hated people with zeros and nines in their numbers because we couldn't stand them. Oh my gosh, every single time I had a friend, he had two zeros in his number, and I am old enough to use a rotary phone. So I was dialing him. I didn't even want to call him anymore because um, you had to wait. But you paid based upon distance, right? So... If I, pay, if, I, if I called to Florida versus, or sorry, Florida versus California, there was, there was a charge because the way that the municipalities were set up at the time, it was based upon distance because I had to run that line there. So West kind of became in the center, and they did call center. It's psychic hotlines, among other things. And business was good. It was booming. We continued to grow doing other things, and by the way, we don't do any psychic hotlines anymore anymore, and we never did the 900 numbers, so don't even ask me about that. So we've always done good in that regard. But we've become this organization that does life cycle management for our customers. And I'm going to show you why WSO2 becomes so important for us to incorporate them into our platform. So West has a couple divisions. I told you about the conference calling. I told you about 911, but we have this whole division called West Interactive Services. West Interactive Services really does this lifecycle management for our customers. So we not only build the technology for them, and you know, a lot of technology goes into those obnoxious IVRs that you have to pick up and dial, right? Press one for this, press two for that. Lots of back-end work goes into that. And so we do that, but we're also doing inbound, we do outbound, and West Interactive, the division that I'm with, we focus on that inbound, outbound, and what we would call hosted contact center or cloud contact center. And we spend a lot of our effort and time developing applications and platforms that work for our customers in this regard. And we have a lot of the top Fortune 100 customers. It's pretty interesting, you know, before I got recruited a year ago to come to West, you know, I had no idea who West was. And once I get there, then I look at the customer list, and our customer list is pretty amazing in that regard. What that simply means for me at the end of the day is there's high standards <laughs> that I have to adhere to. Because it's not just feature functionality that I have to deal with, it's scale. And we're going to talk a lot about scale here. So these are kind of our core offerings that we deal with. And we wrap all these up into this thing that we call customer experience, which I'm going to talk a lot about. And by the way, is the Forrester guy in the room? 
Because he used my slide. I paid for that slide. I'm so bummed. All right, okay. So this is the stuff that we, we deal with. It's IVR self-service, proactive communications. We got mobility, cloud contact center. And then I put on the slide professional services, but it's not really professional services. We, we partner with our customers in a unique way. So I've worked at a couple of companies in the past, and typically this is how it goes. We build a widget, right? Work in software development, we build a widget, we hand you the widget or software, whatever it might be. You consume that, and if you have problems, here's an 800 number, feel free to give us a buzz. West doesn't work that way. West teams up with the customer and says, we're gonna build this widget with you, software with you, and once we're done, you can consume it, and by the way, we'll sit there with you the entire time. It's like dating and it kind of goes on and on and on. So we date a lot of customers. Now, I am from Utah, so let's not get into the whole polygamy thing, but we do date lots of customers, and we do it well, and we're engaged to all of them. We'll talk more about dating as well. There's this whole thing called customer experience, and by the way, in the industry, this thing is crazy. I have read so much stuff on customer experience, but really, what is customer experience? This is what West is trying to help our clients do for their customers. Customer experience is the whole integrated fact of how you feel when you contact a business. Now, I don't want to throw anybody under the table, Avis, but they don't know what customer experience is, Delta, Verizon. Um, these are the problems that we run into is these guys don't know. When I want to talk to you, you should know who I am. Why, as a platinum flyer on Delta, almost diamond this year, do I have to tell them what my number is? Why do I have to tell them what my frequent flyer number is? They don't know my cell phone number. This is my curved phone, by the way, that she was talking about. Um, they don't know my cell phone number, really? They can't go in and look at what's going on? And by the way, if I'm calling you 15 minutes before my flight, how come you have no context whatsoever about why I'm calling? This is customer experience. We have to change that. We can't, we can't be unknown in what we're doing with that stuff. So we're building a platform. We've been building this platform for quite some time. Guys smarter than I that are sitting over there uh, are, are working on this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll show you how we consume WSO2 to make this happen. But we have built, started building this platform called Customer Experience Management. And it's not just the standard industry term. It's the tying together of this whole idea of multi-channel and omni-channel. And, and most people don't understand the distinction between the two. Multi-channel is, I want to interact with you via SMS, via voice call, via email, via Twitter, whatever it might be. I want to interact with you, business, and I need you to respond back to me. Omni-channel is how you feel about that. So if I interact with you on voice and it's different from my SMS, that's Wrong. That's not omnichannel. Omnichannel is my experience as a client of how I feel about those interactions. So we've been building this platform that merges those things together. And this has been hard for us because we've been a reactive organization. Most of the time, big enterprise customers come to us and say, we want you to build this, and we stand up an entire platform just for them and make that work. Mm. We'll talk about the challenges with that, but the biggest one you can see is our cost model fails when we do that. We don't get a good cost model, and it's, it ends up being prohibitive, especially when you get market demands that start pushing on you and start driving your costs lower. And you have competitors, and that's a whole other story, where they can offer feature functionality, but they can't offer scale like we can. So let me show you a little video here about, and Harry, I hope you're going to cue this up, about what we think customer experience looks like. Do you know me by the sound of my voice? It may sound steady, but my mind is racing. From home, to work, two places at once, to the unexpected. I go from screen to screen, conversation to chatter, without skipping a beat. One experience after another. And when I need you, I don't think about how or where. I just need you to pick up. Pick up the phone. Pick up on my words. Pick up the pieces. Show me you know me. Help me find what I want before I know I need it. Make me feel not just like everybody else. Like me. 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 Engage me on my turf. Talk with me in terms I understand. Be smart. Help me make the connection faster, more securely. Make it feel like your brand knows me. Connect with me, and I'll be yours for life. You look at that one-on-one -on -one interaction. It needs to be personalized. Because... And I think this is the Forrester guy's slide, 
And I bought it, by the way. I paid money for that slide. I'm going to get him. Where is he? Um, But what's interesting about this slide, and I don't know if he brought this up because I didn't hear all of his talking points, but when you interview companies, they say, what's the number one thing that you want to do? And 90% of the time, they're going to say, grow revenue. That's just America. It's capitalistic, right? We want to grow revenue. But the second thing, and only by 2% shy of that, is this whole idea of customer experience. And here's where I would tell companies they're wrong. Those two are tied together. There's no difference. The competition in the marketplace is completely changing. We, the, the numbers and stats that are growing when it comes to not only just our development life cycle, but how much customers want more is growing tremendously. You guys ever hear the story of Domino's Pizza, the CEO? He went to one of the restaurants. He uh, ate a slice of pizza, and he said, it tastes like cardboard. I'm going to change it. Do you know where Domino's revenue is today? Three times where they were five years ago. Do you know why? Because they changed the way they made pizza. They changed their customer experience of how you could interact with them. They made a game. If you've never downloaded it, you have a game where you can order pizza on your phone and people are going crazy about it because they're changing customer experience. It's a great example of a company that knows how to look and interact. And by the way, their competitors, again, I won't mention names, Pizza Hut, will not make any progress if they don't change their game. And we at West know that, so we have to change ours. But it's this multi-channel consistency. I've got to have the consistency across the board when I'm contacting a vendor. It's not this is horrible. De- I don't mean to throw Delta under the bus again, but I'm going to. They're actually one of the better airlines out there. I mean, has anybody ever flown Frontier? Oh, my gosh. Anybody flown Frontier? Raise your hand. Just, it's okay. Yep, he has. All right. Frontier is off. They tra- like, Spirit Airways charged me to use the restroom one time. That was really, really weird. Frontier charges you for everything. I was like, gosh, I got to go. I don't know that I have five bucks. Um, <laughs> It's, it's horrible, but uh, Delta, Delta's, Delta's still trying to figure this out. But why, when I, I tweet occasionally, um, and you, you're welcome to follow me, it's etc. with an X, C-E-T-R-A, um, and, and, and I tweeted about my experience, my latest experience with Delta. No channel consistency. I didn't get a phone call. I didn't get a reaction. Nothing. And I know for a fact they have 10 people who sit there and watch tweets all the time. So if I'm going to run a hashtag or an at sign in front of their name, they should dang well know it. And that's been one of the problems. In addition, when I call in, I want, you to, I want them to know that I just tweeted about them, that I just had a really, really bad experience because the gate agent in Orlando, Florida, shut the door on me 20 seconds before the flight, before I was supposed to board the flight. And, uh, yeah, I was frustrated. That, that uh, didn't make me happy at all. You know, you ever seen somebody bang on the door? You've seen that in the movies? Yeah, that was me. So I did that, and um, I had to wait five hours for the next flight. So really, what does this all mean? Well, customers want to connect with a company with their choice of communication, whether that be mobile, web, phone, or text. And we've heard this, and there's companies out here who are saying they can do it. The challenge is you can't sc- they can't scale. I, I, I've worked for the competition, and I've been with my customers when they have wanted to try something different, and I said, okay, can they do 8,000 transactions in a second? No, they can't. And so when we looked at rebuilding our platform, we had to take all these things into consideration. So the smarter guys in the room, uh, my team, they really looked at what is it going to take to get us to be able to scale and get us that feature functionality, get that delivery method out there. It's also expected that we know who you are. And, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it's one thing to understand my history, which how many companies do? Very, very little. It's the next thing is to predict what I'm going to do next. Again, I'm not about mentioning names up here. But there is a company that has little, they put satellites on your house and you get TV. Okay, so there's a company that does that. If I buy the Mayweather fight, then wouldn't it be interesting if the day that Southpaw, has anybody seen Southpaw? Yeah. If anybody, if if the day that Southpaw gets released, that that would be suggested as a movie for me? Why not? They get revenue from this stuff. So it's, it's important, and so we work with companies like that to make that happen. And it's expected that the customer experience is consistent across all those channels of communication. And remember, 
omni-channel. And I'm so glad that you guys are in this room because I'm so tired of in the marketplace hearing the different, everybody goes, we can't use multi-channel anymore. We gotta use the term omni-channel just because it's a new word. No, 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 they're two different things. Multi-channel is how I interact with you. Omni-channel is how I feel about it. So let's, I'm gonna show you one more demo of what it kind of looks like when West takes this to the next level. Harry, will you go ahead and play that video? build IVR, it's because we, you know, Martin Luther King said, if you're going to do anything right, make sure that it's making a difference in somebody else's life. And so we try to do that. We try to make the ease of use for our customers, customers to consume them better. But we have these rich requirements that we have to adhere to. I told you already about scale. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be cloud-enabled. We always have the speed thing. Anybody, anybody code in here? It's so funny when uh, my boss comes to me. And he's like, you know, I, I say, you know what prioritization looks like? It means that you put something at number one. You can't always have two, three, four ones. You have to choose, right? It's got to be number one, number two, number three, or four. Product management, that's the whole idea behind prioritization. Put a value to it and then tell me what's number one. And he is always like, I, I need them both still. Good speech, Andy. And I say, okay, great. Well, you can have a good, you can have a fast, or you can have a, you can have good, fast, or cheap. Which one do you, pick two, because you can't have all three. And he always says, I want a good and I want a fast. Fine. Then it's not going to be cheap, because we've got to be able to enable and do that. So these have been some of our requirements that we've had to deal with. I need more standardized technology. The way that we grew up, being reactive in our business, has served us so well. We got so good at this whole X, Y, Z thing. And this is my analogy on the X, Y, Z thing. Customers would come to us and say, I need X, Y, Z. And we say, okay, we can do that. We will build that. We will figure that out and we will build that for you with X amount of dollars. But once we started building it, then they suddenly came up and said, well, I need you to merge X, Y, Z with these other requirements, which is one, two, three, and you need to bring them together. And we go, well, that's not been done before, but we'd be happy to do that. And so we've continued to do that, and we've done that in siloed ways in the past. And again, it served us well. We can scale really, really well. That's one of our biggest benefits. Feature functionality, we've got all of that. But we came to an inflection point where we said, these things have to merge. I've got to get to a point where I can do a better cost model. I've got to get to a point where I can manage those customer requirements as flexible as I want to be with them into a standards-based application. And this is where WSO2 comes in for us. And then finally, I've got to be able to start doing more predictive stuff. It's awesome that I know the history of what's going on with my customers. Customers. I need to know that, but I need to go to the next level. I need to start knowing not just predictive intent, but what do the analytics actually say? Have you guys ever had this experience where you've gone on Google and you've searched something, and the next thing you know, you're on Facebook and there's an ad for it? Anybody have that? So I was looking for a heart rate monitor um, because my traveling, I've, you know, I've added at least a pound or two, and, and so I wanted a heart rate monitor because I work out pretty rigorously and the, my chest one, you can't replace the battery in it without, uh, seriously, you have to take a knife and cut it open and then replace the battery. It's really weird. So I said, I'll just bag that. I'll just buy a, a new one. And I wanted one that sat on the arm. And so I just looked up, and it's a rhythm heart rate monitor. I looked it up, and it was, that was like a week and a half ago. I'm still getting ads for rhythm heart rate monitors. And I, 
Of course, I ordered it on Amazon. Now I'm getting ads for other things around the heart rate monitors. For Fitbits, I already have a, the, the jawbone thing, so I'm good. But they, they still, they know what I'm doing. That's analytics. Google knows what I'm doing. They know what I'm looking at. So why can't I do that in other parts of the business? Why can't I do that? If you've called into an IVR two, three, four, five times to do certain things, why is there no historical context of that? That's what West is changing today. So analytics becomes this huge important component because not only do I want to know what you want to do, but one of our latest software releases that we just did, we work with a health, again, I'm not about mentioning company names, but we work with a um, healthcare company. Well, they have little shops and they have pharmacies inside them. And um, anyway, they, uh, they do an allergy thing. So if you have normally got allergy medication, you sign up and you get a text notification that, you know what, it's allergy season again. You better come in and get your, I don't know, is Allegra D, I think it's still a pharmaceutical thing. I think you still have to go to the pharmacy. Maybe that's off the shelf. Whatever the Allegra D is that you can't buy off the shelf and that you have to sign that paper for because people use it for weird stuff. That, they send you that notification. That's big for them. And then they, by the way, they found that if they send you that notification via text or another method, their likelihood of you coming in is over 70%. So we enable that to happen. And we send that out. But the latest software that we just released, now if I call in after I've received that notification, it changes the IVR. Mr. Bird, you uh, just received a text notification about your illegal Allegra D or whatever it is. Um, would you like to hear the prescription? Would you like to hear the, uh, the uh, description on how you're supposed to take that? Press one. We can change that IVR so that it goes into that experience. It's context, context of why I called in. So these were our requirements. So they were stiff and heavy, these requirements. It was important for us to find a partner that could help us achieve all this. So our objectives were, we gotta get to this product-oriented approach. We have to admit, one of, one of our other challenges is we have technical debt out there. When you, when you run a couple of complex event processing engines, when you run a couple of different business rules management engines, when you run different databases, uh, it's just not, it's not sustainable and it's not supportable. So we had to start developing a layer of standards. And this is where WSO2 came in as we started evaluating. It was huge because if, if, if we had gone with some of the other players, we, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do certain things like WSO2 gives me the opportunity to try it before we buy it. And we're a couple years into this, and we're still trying different components. I'll talk about those here in a few. So this, this was big for us, because we got to get to the standards. And by the way, the nice part for me is I was out at one of these customers in Providence, Rhode Island. By the way, my daughter, my seven-year-old daughter, she says, Daddy, when you were in Rhode Island, could you just go like this and touch both sides of the state? And I said, no, I tried. It didn't work, but it is that small. Um, you can literally drive across it in a couple of hours. It's a nice place to go, by the way. But I'm out there visiting them, and I was talking about our vision of what we're trying to do here. And they said, so what are you using for your ESB? I said, WSO2. He didn't ask me any other questions. I need that. I need that type of confidence because I don't want to get... I don't want to get into, the CIO, into a conversation with the CIO of another company who's my customer, who I'm trying to take care of, and I don't need to get into a justification route. I didn't have to. As soon as I said that, it was done. They're, going to use the, they're using the same thing as well. So that made life easy for me. And then, of course, we have to enable these features that are omni-channel. So let's talk a little bit more about why we chose WSO2. Well, open source is key, right? We had to have the open source. We have been so proprietary for so long, it was critical for us to make sure that we weren't proprietary in all that we did. It had to be flexible. I had to be able to really get into that service-oriented architecture that I wanted to, well, I, we, that we wanted to get into. That was huge for us. So we took the time did the, did, the look, did the learnings to make sure that, that it was there. And I told you about the scale stuff. It had to be enterprise grade. And I needed all these components, right? We, 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 had to, 
We had to look at all these components. When you're looking at an API manager, when you're looking at an ESB, when you're looking at the data set, these were the things that made it sense for us so we could kind of go to one source, not kind of, but we did go to one source to get that done. And then integration. I mean, it was by design the way they set that up. And we, so I have one customer today that I have to deal with that has, that we manage 43 APIs for them, 43. And by the way, they're written all different. So, I mean, you asked if they're restful, not necessarily. I mean, they're, it's, it's pretty crazy. So we have to standardize our API economy as well, and they helped us do this. So if you look at how we implemented it, this is how our architecture actually looks like. We have this whole multi-channel component. We do all this customer care up at the top, and we're dealing with our customers with an API most of the time. Some of the times we're writing it for them. Some of the times they write it. Some of the times we go to a third party and get it. And we started putting in components. And we went to our pain points. Our biggest pain points was this whole middleware portion. And that's where we got into the ESB. And once we did it, the beautiful thing that happened, and again, we're in it, so I shouldn't say we did it, we're in it today. The beautiful thing that happened is the rest of West said, how are you doing that? And they started looking at this as well. And they've been incorporating it. And then we went to our other pain point, application server. How do we get that done? We gotta solve the services problem. We have that. And then of course the data services server. These things have been huge for us. We've had a lot of learnings. Again, you know, I'll be around after uh, for lunch and afterwards, uh, you're welcome to talk to me. My team is probably s much, much smarter than I am and they, they can tell you even more. But these, these were our pain points that we had to solve and WSO2 has allowed us to do that. Our next steps, well, I've gotta have centralized identity. So we have to have the identity server and then we talked about the APIs. I've gotta get, got get that problem solved as well. That will continue to be a pain point for us because, I mean, when you're running a P&L business, at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out what my costs are and how do I manage them. And you get into this build by partner scenario. And some of these things we've built in the past, and that's been good. Some of these things we've acquired in the past, and that's been good. But now we get into a standards-based architecture that we can all feel comfortable with, scale, and grow. And then lastly, we'll get into this whole area, and most of this is about governance and data analytics that we will be taking over those components as well, allowing WSO2 to have even more foothold into our platform. Again, because it's been safe for us. And I have to make sure that I deliver on that customer experience that we talked about for my customers. So let me show you what the next generation of uh, inbound looks like. This is National Group. According to our records, you're currently receiving monthly paper statements. As a valued card member, we want to give you choices and convenience. So we'd like to offer you the opportunity to switch now to monthly electronic statements. If you switch today, we'll deposit 1,000 reward points into your account as thanks for your participation. It only takes about two minutes to sign up. So would you like to enroll in monthly paperless statements today? Yes. Perfect. First, am I speaking with Mr. Smith? Yes. I'm sending a text message to your mobile phone now. Please do not hang up. Instead, I'll stay on the line. When you receive the text message, simply click on the link to sign up. Then I'll confirm a few account details with you to complete your enrollment. Now to ensure your security and privacy, please choose your billing address street number from the options available on the mobile web page. 
Next, let's choose the email address you want to use for paperless statements. If the email address is correct, just click Next. Otherwise, feel free to change it. Finally, in addition to receiving your paperless statements, please let us know if you'd like to receive other valuable card member information. This is completely optional. Great! Thank you for signing up for paperless statements. 1,000 reward points have been deposited into your account. To learn more about how you can use your points, please download our mobile app using the link on the page. And she does it, but that's okay. So, that is understanding the context. The person called in, recognized that they were on a mobile device, was able to then interact with them without using an app. And by the way, this is huge because you know we're app heavy, right? All of us, we're so app heavy. I don't know what the record is in the room, but I'd be, I bet it's above 200 different apps on your phone. We get so app heavy. So I have to be able to, we have to be able to, to change that so that they can use it just through HTML or just through a browser-based application. And the easiest way to do that is through SMS. So that becomes the minimum viable product for us. And then we get that interactive component where the IVR is actually knowing what's going on on the phone at any given time. Now, that was one example. There's other examples we could use. I, I hate even pressing one. So when I call in, I want you to know that I'm on a mobile phone. I want you to change my mobile phone as soon as that happens and let me go through the, let me visualize all those prompts. Those are the things that we're working on. And again, WSO2 has enabled us to get there. So what are our lessons? So we've been in this for a little while. The lessons that we've learned so far in incorporating WSO2 into our stack, into our platform to make these next generation applications work. Well, one, you got to invest. This is, this is, this is the scary part when you have tr open source and try before you buy. Everybody thinks, well, ah, we can probably get away with not putting too much into that. No, you have to invest. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Craig Webster who runs our product uh, development team who's in the room, he came and he said, when we started doing some of this, he said, I need two WSO2 architects. And then he showed me the price tag for them. You have to invest. It was that important. And they've been critical for our success and key for the, our performance. Second, WSO2 support is essential. So if you haven't implemented WSO2 yet, or any one of their components, uh, I always want to think it's 19, but however many that they have, you've got to make sure that you're incorporating their support as part of your understanding. And there's two things with that. One, you, you need to make sure that you engage in that partnership, but two, you need to plan for it. Because some, uh, we have a development teams in Australia, in the UK, in San Jose, and in Omaha. And we have to account for time zone things. We have to account for it with the WSO2 architecture and support as well. So it's something that you just, you got to be cognizant and mindful of. Because if you don't, um, it, will, it will get you. So you've got to make sure that you're, you're paying attention to that. And then you've got to supplement your staff. So it's not just about the investment and what you're building and the people, but you've got to be able to supplement your staff. So within our agile development teams, which is new for us, by the way, we, we went from a waterfall shop to an agile shop in, in a little less than a year. In doing that, one of the things that becomes important is to mix and mingle, right? I've got to incorporate those WSO2 people, the ones that have knowledge of that stack within those teams. And we've done that. And we've done a really good job with that. And it's been huge. The other big thing, and we've got our platform folks in the room, is architectural reviews are huge. We have such a high demand from our customers on how we should perform. Everybody talks about five nines of availability. Our customers expect five nines plus, I always say. They do. So I have to have architectural reviews on a regular basis to make sure that we're implementing all of these components, shared or not, for our customers and make sure that we're doing it right. And let the guys in the room who are talking about resiliency and talking about redundancy and talking about the, how those components are gonna work and interact with one another, you need to actually spend the time doing it. And that's, that's been a critical key uh, learning for us. You know, I, I think I told you, but I had a boss that uh, said, if you're gonna fail, fail fast, and then move on. And I've failed fast plenty of times in my life. This is, this is one of those areas where if you have architectural review, you can get those learnings quick. And then finally, and I'm a big 
proponent of this across the board is developing a release cadence. If you don't have a release cadence that is, you have to understand, there, we're disciplined about our code, very disciplined about our code. But WSO2 is very disciplined about their code. And when they release patches, you need to be, you need to, you need to work in harmony and in sync with that. You know, technical debt for me is when you have Things that legacy platforms that are not supportable and they've got two guys holding two wires together, keeping it working. By the way, I gotta tell you this story. A developer, um, when I first came to West, I was talking to him and he's like, oh, I built this application, it's really cool. I said, do we have customers on it? He's like, oh, not quite yet. He's like, I have to keep it stood up. And I was like, oh, how do you do that? He's like, uh, I got a computer next to my bed and I hit the enter key about every three and a half hours. So well, that doesn't help you with sleeping and so we should probably rewrite that code. But those are the things that cause you problems, right, is when you have that kind of rogue stuff going on. So a release cadence keeps everything in sync, keeps everything in line, and keeps everybody moving in the same path and, and direction. But we'll continue to move forward with WSO2, right? We have this whole idea of a service-oriented architecture that we have to do. We have an organization with our organization we call it EIT, um, because they don't want to be called IT. They want the E in front of it because E is enterprise. I, wa I asked them, I said, do you want to be SIT so you can be super IT? And they don't. They, they're, um, they're there and, and they're utilizing this. So they're incorporating this across our organization. I mean, when, when you look at the stats that I showed you earlier, 159 million conference calls. I mean, we've got so much stuff going on on our platform. So for us to rely on a company like WSO2 to help make that happen is big. It's massive. It's the dependency in our business. So we'll continue to extend it to the West Enterprise, but if you want, if you want me to talk about, and, and I think my team would agree, we have this crazy vision. When we talk about our customer experience management platform, I want to be predictive. I want to know why you're calling in. I want to know why I need to send you that text. And then when we talk about monetization, everybody does transaction-based monetization. I want to change that whole entire game. And WSO2 is going to help us get there, but I'd rather go to my customer and say, the customer who I didn't mention who sends out allergy stuff. So it makes you $40 million a month to send out these allergy notifications. Awesome. I want 5% if we make that work. And if I perform and I don't fail, I want a bonus. Why not? Why can't I get to a point to do that? And then I'm going to be predictive with you, Mr. Customer. I'm going to walk arm in arm with you because now that they've got the allergy medication, well, well I almost used that analogy, um, maybe they need another medication. Maybe they need Celexia or something else. I need to know that, and I need to know why they're calling in the next time. And if I do that for you, I want another bonus. If I can get predictive about why people are calling in, the Mayweather fight is another good example. If I know that you're calling in to order up Southpaw or whatever movie it might be, then you give me a bonus every single time it happens. Let's bag this whole transaction stuff. Yeah, so you use my platform. I want it to bring value to my customers. So if it does, if we bring value to our customers and we change the game for them and we bring additional revenue in for them, why would I charge you a per transaction basis? I want to I want to share in the profits. I want to do well with you. That becomes a true partnership. So we have this vision going on. And then finally, because I'm the last thing that stands between you and lunch, is align omnichannel and business analytics. I told you, we know, I can tell you historically what people have done in the past. That predictive thing becomes even harder. But then it's the conglomeration of all that data, you know, utilizing a single data lake, data repository, making sure that I can pull that information from a single source at any given time. That will be huge for us, and we're going to continue to work on that. But I need to know that the SMSs, the voice calls, the emails, the Twitters, they're all coming in, and they're coming into the same layer so that I can go look at that database and make decisions right away. And we're doing a lot of that today, and we want to do more. With that, I thank you. I'm ending one minute and 52 seconds early so that you guys can get to lunch. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.